Hi, everybody. My name is Robert Egan, and I am the Ohio Playwrights Conference Artistic Director. And this is a program we call Foundry Talks. And uh, I'm very, very, very happy to have our longtime colleague and my good friend, Luis Alfaro. Hi, Bob. <laughs> um, so how are, you, how are you today? How are you filling your days these days, Luis? Well, I'm so busy because I'm trying to be an artist and also part of my art practice is being a teacher. So, you know, school has started officially and we're all on a Zoom platform. And um, so I'm running the gamut of uh, really young, young people, 18 years old to, you know, graduate students who are coming back and kind of refiguring their lives out. So, yeah, this week feels like that kind of week. It's kind of an art week where it's almost like when you do dramaturgy, where, you know, that first week you're just trying to figure out what kind of artist you're working with, <laughs> what the conversation is, right? So for me, that's always that first week. And I use, um, I use a famous Joe Chaikin. I don't know if you, uh, uh, you've read this book called The Presence of the Actor, but he has this amazing quote in it. And he says, um, the one question he asks of every character that he creates is, what is the one thing that people cannot see when they look at you? Wow. It's a great question, right? So every student this week answered it in varying degrees of heartbreak and joy and beauty and revelation of self. And so, you know, it's been a kind of beautiful week for that. And at Ojai, you know, because I'm making work at Ojai, this keeps me kind of like, right, in my mind and in my spirit and in my body. And, you know, because we're on a Zoom platform, we're not in our bodies you know the thing about ohi that's so extraordinary is that sense of place mm. recreating place or community in the virtual world a little bit different yeah. would you agree oh yes very much so i was going to say uh using the chaken quote what is it that pe you think people do not see in this particular time the pandemic time of the challenge for a playwright, an artist? What, what are the big challenges in this environment? Well, I think, you know, uh, we, we, we always say that we're, we're solitary creatures, but we're actually really social creatures. We're research people, right? Like we are, we're, um, we're the seers of a culture, right? So we see, we interpret, we channel. And in order to do that, we have to be in the culture. We have to be in the world. So, you know, isolation felt really fun in week, a month, one maybe. And then it was like, oh, now I'm not really doing what I need to do as an artist, but I can't really be out there, right? So in a way, am I doing it through my artwork or how am I doing it? How am I, how am I still staying uh, true to the thing that I do as an artist? So in some ways, I think that's where our politics get activated and our desire to connect with community in the world. I was on a, a very interesting routine where, um, you know, I wake up at, at you know, at sunrise, 4, 4.35 in the morning, before sunrise, <laughs> because I was walking around Olympic and Crenshaw with nobody around in the dark. And then, you know, I would do it again at night at 11 with nobody around in the dark, kind of thinking this is good, that like, this is a way of avoiding, you know, anything, but also, I can't avoid people, you know? So I have to figure out how to be around people and how to be around the world and also s stay safe. Yeah, yeah. So what, um, what, what kind of things are keeping you involved? And, and maybe you could talk, as, if it's true, the Foundry Project as being one element of that. But, but what, what kind of things are you doing to stay involved? Because I agree with you completely, we live in a, uh, you know, a time, what we always don't like to say, but an incredibly dangerous time. Yeah. Politically, environmentally, virally. Uh, so we need your voices more now than ever, I believe. I think artists are, and particularly someone like yourself, are essential workers in helping us imagine the moment we're in and hopefully help us reimagine where we're going once we start to get a grasp on this. So anyway. Yeah, I mean, I love what you're saying because I feel like we need to have the connective tissue, right? Yeah. And one of the ways to do that is, I mean, oh, it's been a little bit of a lifesaver. I was thinking about this the other day. I'm around other playwrights. 
you know, in a, in a regular, consistent way, I'm listening to beautiful new work. I'm watching people wrestle with their process, with their ideas, and I'm in the same place. I'm in the same vulnerable, exciting, uh, you know, a, at the edge of the cliff, walking through fireplace, right? And so the nice thing about that is this ability to keep, um, to stay in community, right? To build community, to imagine the community is always present in your life is important, you know? So, yeah, that means Ojai in that respect feels to me essential. It's a little bit of a lifeline right now because otherwise I am um, never around other artists, right? Not at the moment. So I think that's really, really important. And I think that art is about a connective tissue. It really is about a consistent thread. You know, I like to describe that thread, you know, as um, I'm connecting off of another idea, off of another experience, off of another art impulse, right? So I would say that like um, every play we've heard so far without giving away the contents of a play have also been a kind of light bulb going off, right? Um, it's not a surprise to me that I'm writing about spirituality and isolation and loneliness. Like how interesting, right? But that's the play that's sitting in me, right? The play that sits in me is um, another maybe idea like the Joe Chaikin that I, that I uh, subscribe to a lot is a living theater idea. Move towards the thing that needs you the most. Yes. Move towards the thing that needs you the most. So the thing that needs me the most right now is to come into contact and confront that sense of isolation we're having in our culture. How is this moment not a desperate moment, but a spiritual moment? How is this moment possibly a gift? No. You know, when I mention it, some people kind of bristle at the thought. How is this possible um pause right this pandemic pause actually the beginning of a meditative move towards something new so something new something more exciting deeper in our lives what was i doing before this i don't remember anymore i was running so fast yeah i, I read a quote the other day i'm not sure what i think about it yet i'll have to have a long conversation with you about it, it was uh, uh, a, a clever man wants to change the world a wise man wants to change themselves. <laughs> very, very true. And yeah, you're only conduit, right? Yeah, and I do think that this time has, in some ways, forced a confrontation with self. I, I know I'm going through that, uh, which has been a good thing. And and <laughs> you know, in the, you know, in a crazy way, it's made me love the city I'm in. So I live in Los yeah. Angeles. Uh, yeah. You know, I love Los Angeles. I live in Koreatown, which is the densest neighborhood of all of Los Angeles is 66 neighborhoods. Yeah. I think the average, I think I was reading this the other day, the average uh, number of people in my neighborhood is over 100,000 per square mile. So this is a lot of people in, packed into one place. And 224 languages spoken yeah. in, this in this city, right? Yeah. Uh, it's kind of like, the, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, astounding. And the one thing that's happened to me in an extraordinary way is because I always move a lot because I like the dislocation of new places, discovery, but um, I've never gotten close to my neighbors and I'm incredibly close to these elderly neighbors who are from Central America, the Salvadorian, and I've been buying their groceries for them and they've been buying, buying me dinner and I buy them their desserts and, you know, all of a sudden they're into my... Taiwanese cream puffs that I go all the way to the Alhambra to get for them. And the other day I brought them cronuts and that was a brand new experience for them. And they brought me pasteles and, you know, like I never had these relationships or these experiences as an artist in LA. And all of a sudden things are very deep, you know? Yeah. Uh, can you talk um, about your play a little bit? What, what your, uh, you just said uh, isolation and spirituality. I've had the good fortune of um, reading, hearing, both reading the play and hearing it read. Um, and if you, I was gonna say to people, if you have, if you get an opportunity to follow Luis on Facebook, do so because you will get a great tour of what Luis just described, his love of the city and all the look, little nooks and crannies and people that populate our city. But um, tell me about, uh, it's, it's very theatrical. Um, 
and um, and a great piece of Alfarioian writing there. <laughs> Well, I will say that, you know, everything comes from a source, and I think sometimes I get obsessive about things, and one thing I read about was the Catholic Church, you know, they have so many lawsuits, and one of the ways that they've combated the, the loss of money is to get rid of anything that doesn't make money, and in California, there's been a record number of closures, uh, you know, schools, um, you know, and it orders that the church had money invested in. And mostly it's happened in the Central Valley and more isolated places. So I read a story about a, a, a brother in an order who had hung himself when they announced the closing of the order because he had never been out real, sort of in the real world, right? And I thought about that. And right in real time, I think things converge all at the same time sometimes for artists to make our work. I read... Um, Lorca's The House of Bernardo Alba, and I read it in Spanish, which, you know, I've been working on my Spanish, so La Casa de Bernardo Alba is an amazing piece of Spanish literature because it's, it's poetry. He wrote so poetically, and when you read it in the language he wrote it in, you're like, wow, this is almost like a, a choreo poem, you know, it's, it reads in that rhythmic way. And the other thing I read was my teacher, uh, my former teacher, Irene Fornes' Mud, and Irene, you know, has this kind of like wonderful renegade spirit, this, you know, disillusion to uh, allegiance to order, you know. So both of those really played on me. And then, and then uh, this obsession with trying to understand what was going on in this order started to play out. And then, you know, the magic of what Irene does in writing and sets you off, because I subscribe to her exercises. That's how I write a play. And the power of poetry in Lorca, you know, and so not to be afraid of weird poetic images. There's a guy in my play who lives in a bathtub, and I don't really want to explain it other than it, it lives as a reality of this world, you know. So I think there's something really fun going on. But also, it's about men who are isolated away from the world. It's about what happens when you um, feel the desperation of your loneliness when you have a breakthrough into your deeper, fuller spiritual self, um, I think that's what it's about. So it's about an order, right? And it's about a young man who is in search of um, a family, a familial, both literal and kind of more spiritual presence in his life. And he's probably been drinking his way all the way down, uh, you know, Highway 99 to, to this order. You know, he's probably been drinking his way there. And, uh, and he's got to come to terms with who he is. And I think that is definitely for me, uh, I'm not drinking my way through my life right now, but, um, but I'm definitely, uh, uh, I think maybe the image for me is I'm in the dark right now and I'm bumping my way through my own sort of um, revelation. Yeah, wow. Where am I? Who am I in this time? What do I want to be? Why am I so emotional right now? Why am I so, uh, why have I turned to meditation? I never was a meditator. And then, why have I turned to the silence of myself at this point in my life, right? I'm hoping you have an answer. <laughs> we always hear voices in our head as writers, right? But then the voices get clearer, right? Yes. Yes, and uh, that's been true for me too. I'm on this 90-day uh, cleansing thing where I'm eating very pure, no alcohol, trying to stay active and exercise. So the what fills my head is very different than when I can uh, make some noise up there with other kinds. Yes. I have a friend who works at a, at a pot dispensary so early in the in the pandemic, he brought me a, like I have so many bags of what they're called pot gummies. Yeah. And, and he said this, and they also the bags say calm. That's the kind of marijuana it is, right? Because right. to make you calm. And the first like the first desperate night of the pandemic, which must have been like a week into it, I took two calm gummies, yeah. and I was up till three in the morning on my knees uh, cleaning my kitchen floor. <laughs> and I thought, okay. No booze, yeah. no drugs. We're gonna do this. And you yeah. wrote three plays. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, I, I think going clean is a beautiful metaphor also. Yeah. Yeah. 
And we'll be back uh, soon with more of Luis down the road. So thank you very much, Luis. Thank you, Bob. Yeah.